Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and today we have a very special guest, Michael Schneider from Paris, France. Uh, Michael was honored with the Right Livelihood Award, which is also called the Alternative Nobel Prize, for his work on plutonium. In addition, he's um, been an independent consultant on energy matters around the world uh, for decades. Um, so I'd like to thank you, Michael, for joining us. Well, thanks very much for having me. You know, Michael, when I am out on the stump speaking to people, the, the impression here in, in America is that the French know how to do nuclear power. They, they know how to do it right. And I, I'm frequently told by people, uh, why can't we do it like the, uh, like the French? Now, we're going to be posting on our website uh, a, a report that you published. And it's, um, uh, it's fascinating because the topic is nuclear power in France beyond the myth. And that's really what I'd like to, to talk about today. So the, the first question is this. Um, it's, it's well known that the, France has the highest percent of nuclear power for electric generation in the world with about, it had been as high as 80% of its power coming from, uh, coming from nuclear power. Was that a decision that was voted upon by the French? No, there was never a vote on uh, nuclear power to, to begin with. Like when the first program was launched, the first large program uh, was launched uh, in 1974, it was a government decision and it was pushed through with the elite technocrats without any kind of um, consultation or vote or anything else. The current level of um, electricity uh, generated by nuclear power is, though, a little less. It's, it's something like 73 percent. But you can say it's a roughly it's been for a number of years, about three quarters. OK. Now, is that going to be the trend in France in the future? Are energy planners planning to be at three quarters or um, you know, where is the French electric uh, nuclear contribution going in the future? Well, it's it's very interesting to um, actually note that there's very little attention internationally to the fact that um, the National Assembly in France just voted uh, legislation in, um, in October uh, that uh, puts out a new target for nuclear power to bring down the share uh, from about three quarters to half of the production of electricity by by nuclear power by 2025. Uh, now, if you look at the attention that gets the uh, nuclear phase out decision in Germany, where they have they are left with nine nuclear power plants, we are talking in France to shut down something like 20 or more nuclear power plants, depending on the level of consumption, of course, at the time of 2025 in order to go down from three quarters to half of the, uh, uh, the uh, nuclear production, uh, the electricity production. So that makes, look, the, the German nuclear phase out actually as a modest uh, project. So, you know, it's interesting. It looks like the French decided to um, uh, build an enormous number of nuclear plants as a result of the Arab oil embargo in the 70s. So their plants would have basically been new in 1980, which means they're a little bit newer than those here in the States. So 1980 plus 40 years is around 2020 or 2025. So you will be getting to the point where these plants have reached the end of their 40-year life expectancy. Very true. Uh, we have uh, now an average lifetime, which is, you know, about the average of the world's uh, average lifetime, which is 28.5 years, it's a little less in France, but it's, it's roughly the same. Um, so very true. In, in the next 10 years, we're, we're going to reach most of that reactor fleet, reaching 40 years um, uh, operational lifetime, and, and therefore uh, a lifetime that is considered at this point um, the end of the, the, the operational design basis. And there's the, the, the um, nuclear safety authorities made it very clear that at this point there's absolutely no guarantee uh, that they will authorize 
uh, these reactors to operate lo- longer than, than 40 years. Okay, so what will replace nuclear in that mix? What's the, the energy plan moving forward? Well, that's French style. We first have targets and then we wonder, hmm, how do we actually get there? So at this point, I cannot you know, say that there is a precise, clear uh, strategy that has been voted on for the time being. It's a clear uh, target. Uh, by the way, it's also a very ambitious target to get the, um, the final energy consumption in 2050 down to half. Uh, which is, you know, staggering if you compare it on the on the international level. How to get there? Well, we'll see. There are some uh, engagements uh, towards the European Union, so the, the France has to boost uh, renewable energies, uh, and at the same time they have to uh, deal with uh, carbon emissions as 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 everywhere. So it will be definitely a challenge to actually get this uh, done, and it's. It's clear that most of those reactors will not be replaced at all. Uh, it, it, there is an interesting statement by the most senior um, government bureaucrat um, in the uh, Ministry of Ecology that, that is in charge of energy. He's the Director General of Energy and Climate Change. And he stated in um, you know, in front of the, an, an inquiry committee at the National Assembly, that there might be a non besoin, like a no need, for around 20 nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear reactors by 2025. So it's basically the idea that you know there will be a lot of um, efficiency uh, needed anyway uh, to get consumption down. And therefore, the, a lot of these reactors will simply not be needed and not needed to be replaced. Yeah. Otherwise, it's clear that the potential for combined heat and power, tri-generation, and the whole range of efficiency and renewables is highly underdeveloped in France. Huh. The, um, you know, we always think of uh, 80% or 75% nuclear means that that's the total energy picture. But really, that's not true. You know, the, the electric segment of the total energy picture in France is, all, is a small piece. So what fraction of the total energy that France consumes, you know, for home heating, for automobiles, et cetera, um, is, uh, is coming from nuclear and how much is fossil fuel? Well, actually, you know, if you add it all up and uh, what is important for people to understand is that we have to look at the primary, what is called a primary energy input. So if you burn uranium or uh, you burn gas or you burn coal, uh, of course, a lot of it is lost in terms of waste heat. In fact, most of the coal plants and nuclear plants have an efficiency level that is only about a third. Uh, the, the best gas plants now do more than 50 percent, but still more than 40 percent of that Uh, primary energy is lost in terms of waste heat into the environment. So the question is, how much actually ends up at the final consumer uh, that you, uh, the um, electricity in this case? And if you then look at how how big is the share of nuclear, then it's currently around 17%. So it shrinks from about three quarters for electricity to 17% in final energy. You know, I have to note, your paper is brilliant on this topic. It, it talks about how France has such a huge uh, amount of electric coming from nukes, and you want to keep those running, that they have, uh, they're one of the few developed countries that actually has a large amount of electric heating of their homes, essentially because if they don't, they have to shut these nuclear plants down. Um, there's clearly a huge energy efficiency there to get rid of that electric heating. Absolutely. I mean, I, in, in my opinion, my personal opinion, electric space heating should be prohibited. Uh, because, you know, basically, take the same example. If you generate electricity, you lose, uh, you know, you lose more than two, two-thirds, up to three-quarters of the energy on the way, and <laughs> reheat air or water. Uh, so you, you lost basically three quarters of the energy on the, on the way 
rather than you know heating gas or heating you know by other means you can also do uh, solar heating you, there's many other ways and first of all to insulate the homes properly mm -hmm. uh, to begin with um, so uh, this was meant really because there was an, an over dimensioning of the nuclear build program to basically push uh, electricity into um, into monopoly markets, and that's a typical use of that. Now, the result of this uh, is terrible, not only for in social terms, because, you know, in nuclear France, which is proud and announces everywhere to have some of the cheapest kilowatt hour prices for our residential and industrial customers, we have now officially five million households in energy poverty. Five million households means over 11 million people. An official paper says three million uh, French households, people are cold in winter. So that is the outcome of the energy policy. Why? Because electric space heating is very inefficient and you know it leads to a huge consumption of uh, kilowatt hours. But on the other hand, there is also a very devastating effect on the electricity system. It, it rips apart the, uh, the energy system with very low consumption in the summer and very high consumption in the winter. It's now a factor of three higher, the, the, the uh, peak load in the winter, than the lowest day uh, in the summer. To give you an idea, when the thermometer drops one degree in winter, the need for additional capacity is 2,600 megawatts. So you need every time that the thermometer drops one degree, which happens, you know, we have drops of 10 degrees. One degree means you need the equivalent of two large nuclear reactors uh, additionally. So it's a very fragile system. Wow. Um the, the, uh, I'd like to go on. One of the things that, uh, that one of the misperceptions uh, about the, the French nuclear power program is that the French recycle all of their nuclear fuel, that they've, um, um, they've, they can take the nuclear fuel from, from the first batch, send it off, and reuse it again and again and again. That, that there's an impression here, here in the United States, States that, that there's, there's, there is no waste from the uh, French program. So could you talk about the French recycling program? Well, first of all, I don't like the term recycling because it, it gives the idea that there is reuse of the entire materials that you actually, uh, you know, that would be otherwise considered waste. Uh, in fact, what happens? Um, the spent fuel or the used nuclear fuel that in countries like the United States is put into dry storage first, you know, in, in uh, ponds close to the reactors and then into dry storage. In France, it is after a few years storage, it's sent to the La Hague so-called reprocessing uh, plant. Uh, in fact, it's called in French, usine de plutonium, which means plutonium factory, which I think is a much more appropriate term actually than, than reprocessing uh, plant. Um, there it is chopped up uh, after another few years, and then uh, it's put into a, 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 a it's put into an acid bath, and the very substances are extracted. The objective of reprocessing is mainly to extract plutonium, uh, originally for nuclear weapons purposes, and then there was a big dream of plutonium fueled fast breeder reactors where the basic idea was to generate more plutonium than they would consume. A wonderful dream, isn't it? I mean, you create more primary energy than, than you actually consume. Jesus, I would, you know, I totally understand the kind of fascination that had. The problem is the fast breeder reactor dream is already dead uh, by the middle, since the middle of the 1980s. But now since the French nuclear leaked technocrats never make a mistake, they never you know, admit that they were wrong and radically change strategy. So what they do is they adapt strategy. So some of that, that plutonium is being used in so-called mixed oxide fuel. Um, it's produced in a facility in the southern France. 
And then this mixed oxide fuel, this MOX fuel, is sent back to, uh, at the most currently, 24 reactors that are licensed for the use of that fuel. However, let me, let me point to, to a couple of major issues. First of all, in the accounts of the owner of that material, the plutonium and the reprocessed uranium, those are the two materials that are extracted for further use, the value, the book value is zero. Now, I have never ever heard of an industry that actually generates a product that has a zero book value. In fact, it has a negative market value because if you try to sell plutonium, you will find out that you have to pay somebody to take it. I mean, we're not talking terrorist organizations, of course. We're talking the energy, international energy market. Uh, you cannot sell plutonium. You have to pay people to actually take it. So picture this. You have a facility that puts out thousands of times the radioactivity that is emitted by a nuclear power plant into the environment in gases and liquid form that leads to over half of the actual collective dose for the European population. And all this in order to generate a substance that has a zero book value and a negative market value. Does that make any sense to you? You know, we have this, the same uh, issue here in the United States. To make a bundle of mixed oxide fuel costs more, a million dollars more per, per bundle than to take the uranium right out of the ground. So, again, when, when you try to use plutonium in the fuel cycle here in the States, it actually is more costly than just directly mining the uranium. So you've built up, if I remember right, 56 tons of, of, um, of plutonium that's just kind of hanging around. Is that true? Yes, that is the amount of unirradiated plutonium. But you see, the problem is that this strategy is actually not even, um, it's not separating all the plutonium and the uranium, and it's even using less than what is separated uh, um, uh, in the first place. So we, this strategy has actually made all of the issues worse. Uh, we have a gigantic backlog of spent fuel, which is now approximately 14,000 tons, of which about 10,000, close to 10,000 tons, are stored in five pools, unprotected, non-hardened pools, at, at the La Hague reprocessing uh, plant, which I consider is a pretty much of a, a security nightmare. Uh, and we have, you know, another 4,000 tons approximately that are in the nuclear power plants. So these stocks, uh, you know, increased. And amazingly enough, when France started the, um, uh, the, the, this strategy of plutonium ext extraction and use in 1987 was the first um, light water reactor loaded with MOX fuel. At that point, France did not have any stock, any significant stock of plutonium, of unirradiated, separated plutonium. So, in fact, this whole strategy was meant, which was meant to absorb stocks, led to the justification to actually build them up. And today we have, you know, all the problems. We have environmental pollution, we have stocks of spent fuel, and we have stocks of unirradiated plutonium. If I can just add one additional point. This is a system. This is not something which is one facility. You need to, to combine all these facilities, and combining these facilities means transports, shipments. So we have about two plutonium shipments between 100 and 200 kilograms per week that go on a 1,000 kilometer trip by truck over public roads, you know, between the La Hague facility and the, in, in the south where the uh, fuel fabrication facility is located. So we have a permanent threat of exposure to attack, to accident, and to other, other problems that we, we, you know, everybody can imagine. 
You know, I should remind our readers, it only takes about 10 kilograms of plutonium to make a bomb. And here you are shipping 200 kilograms uh, around the countryside twice a week. Um, uh, clearly, I can understand your threat uh, from, from terrorists, from, from moving um, uh, you know, the, a bomb-grade material on public roads. Well, most recently, we had a very strange phenomenon here in, in France. Uh, it was uh, reported that there are at least 15 nuclear sites that have been overflown by drones of various sizes that have not been identified. The authors have not been identified and the purpose has not been identified. Uh, now, it might well be that in this case, this is not a very serious threat. Uh, this could be all kinds of uh, um, competition between uh, amateurs of these flying objects, or it could be something else. But, but just imagine that this kind of pattern would be used by people that have very clearly other intentions. Mm -hmm. It shows a way how to get very precise, high-resolution images of details of nuclear facilities. And this is not even looking at an issue like plutonium transports yet. So it's a very fragile system that is very much attackable and it's highly exposed to safety and security risks. You know, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission here in the States is very worried about drones as well. It, it, um, it doesn't even take an attack on the containment from a drone, which would be unlikely, but more likely an attack into the, um, the, the transformers, uh, which would short out the transformers and cause the plant to collapse. Uh, uh, if you couple that with some kind of a, uh, a terrorist action, it suddenly makes the threat much more severe. Uh, so yeah, when I read about the, uh, the drone issue in France, I can just see uh, we'll have it here in the States within a year or so. Well, you know, I mean, I always say it's very strange if people argue the several meter thick containments as if, you know, an attacker would go for the hardest piece. An attacker will always go for a soft target and not for a hard target. You don't even have to discuss details where soft targets are, but there's loads of them. It's very clear that there are many possible ways, many scenarios how to attack, uh, you know, such a facility. And people forget that you know, you go on an airplane and you're not allowed to take liquids on there, uh, even small quantities. You're not allowed to have more than 100 grams of toothpaste. And the, the reason is that if, you know, if you think back in 1988, when the Lockerbie plane, that was a 747, was, was blown off the sky, that was approximately 300 grams of explosives. So 300 grams can be easily transported by any size of a small drone. Can, I wanted to go back for one minute. The, the, the La Hague um, reprocessing plant, and I'm sorry I've not pronounced that right, uh, is, is near the North Sea. And, and I understand that there's contamination in the North Sea as a result of the uh, discharges from that plant. Is that true? Well, of course, it is true. I mean, uh, the, the um, basic strategy that has been uh, taken there is the strategy of the high chimneys uh, of the factories of the 1960s. The higher the chimney, uh, the more uh, pollution gets dispersed. So the solution to pollution is dilution. That's a very old saying, right? And I, I learned with, that in college. <laughs> there you go. So whether we talk about chimneys or we talk about pipes that go into the sea, the, the, the strategy is the same. And just to give you one example, iodine-129 is entirely filtered out of the gases because the gases dose impact low on the local uh, population would be very severe. Uh, but it is, it is filtered out of the gases and entirely 100% pumped into the sea. Now, you, iodine-129 has a half-life of 16 million years. So you ask me whether the sea gets contaminated? Yes, it does. And not only does it get contaminated, it gets contaminated forever. Wow. Um, the, the last question I'd like to ask is on the 
very end of the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, we, of course, uh, had Yucca Mountain, and we may again have Yucca Mountain as the location of the first of, of many nuclear waste storage dumps uh, where the fuel will go um, essentially forever, more than a quarter of a million years. Uh, Maybe. Do, do the French have a program? and Do they have a mountain set aside? And are they already putting nuclear waste into the earth? Well, no, not high level uh, radioactive waste. Um, there is a laboratory that is uh, being built um, in the eastern part of France, uh, which is in a clay formation. Um, I have called this a long time ago the Trojan horse for uh, radioactive waste because it's basically uh, designated or not named a laboratory, but de facto. It's very clear that the strategy is to transform the laboratory into the final disposal site. But it turned out that, that you know, research and ex accept public acceptance is much slower and much less uh, acquired uh, than, than anticipated. So we're looking into a long period of time yet before, uh, you know, commercial quantities of radioactive waste can go underground. There are other facilities that that are the disposal sites that have accepted radioactive waste is of various qualities. Uh, um, one is very close to the um, uh, La Hague reprocessing facility, and another one is, is actually uh, pretty close to the um, final repository, which they will want to uh, transform from the Bureau labo Laboratory. Here um, uh, in the, on the border between uh, Canada and, uh, and the United States, the Canadians are proposing an intermediate facility on um, uh, indigenous people's lands. Um, but it's pretty clear to most of us that after the intermediate facility is put in place, the, right behind it will be you know, high level, essentially nuclear fuel forever. And uh, our concerns here are that it contaminates Lake Huron and the entire Great Lakes system. And it, it sounds like that the, the approach that the Canadians appear to be taking in the, on the northern border of the United States is pretty similar to what you're experiencing in, um, uh, in France as well. Now get your foot in the door with intermediate waste and then say, oh, we might as well put the high-level waste there too. Well, I think it's, it's in the French case. Well, first of all, let me make uh, one comment. I, I have always refused the term fuel cycle because it suggests that there is actually a functioning circular economy, which is not true. Uh, so I, I think we should talk really about a fuel chain that is a much more you know, precise uh, or a much more coherent uh, 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 denomination to what is actually happening. Uh, and it ends up with waste, right, which goes nowhere. So it's it's <laughs> it's well an, an end and not and not sort of a circular uh, industry. Um, the, the the I think the French strategy is really um, that something that is called a laboratory will be will be switched to a final disposal site rather than uh, using lower level wastes first and then higher level wastes. So it's a different um, different scenario. Uh, but uh, you know, I I think that in you know, in many cases, in many countries, many experts say we don't know what to do with high-level radioactive waste. One thing we agree on is that it should go into geological storage. Well, I'm part of a maybe a small minority, but I I, I was never afraid to be long to a, a minority. I don't think it's a good idea. Uh, and I don't think we're ready to actually decide whether this is the best thing to do. So in, in the meantime, I do believe what is relatively quickly possible to do is to create either subsurface storage or other ways of hardened uh, um, storage, intermediate storage facilities that can be in a mountain like the, like, like the Germans have done it, uh, <clears throat> or it can be subsurface hardened, or it can be buildings. But, you know, that allows much easier to get back to 
uh, the materials and uh, you know recondition them or or find another uh, strategy to to dispose of them in a permanent manner. And my last question is this: France has uh, what had been the two largest players in the nuclear game, uh, EDF, uh, your utility that ran all the nuclear plants, and a company called Areva that um, actually was responsible for building the plants. Uh, They've had uh, pretty severe financial reversals lately. Um, what's What's the cause and the ramifications on the French program uh, with the with the financial goings on that uh, that, that Areva and EDF are experiencing. Yes, this is actually a very serious issue, in my opinion. Um, if you if EDF, uh, EDF is Electricité de France. It's a majority state-owned uh, company, um, and Areva is the largest uh, nuclear builder and fuel company. Uh, in the world, um, uh, both of these companies have seen their value on the stock market erode to a n- phenomenal uh, uh, dimension. Uh, uh, EDF lost over 70% of its stock value over the past five years or so, and Arriva up to 85%. Uh, it this is a clear signal that investors do not believe that, you know, um, coming out of the 2008-2009 crisis, these companies will actually manage to pull it off and, you know, develop a strategy that they have confidence in. Uh, now, what the investors do on the stock market is, you know, <laughs> might be their thing. But it's very serious. It can have very serious implications for uh, the safety issue, it can be ha- have very serious implications for long-term, um, uh, you know, nuclear materials management if these, if these companies are actually threatened in existence. And I, I honestly do believe so. Uh, EDF has a huge debt load of over 30 billion uh, euros. That is, uh, you know, way over 40 billion dollars uh, debt load. That's the kind of level that that countries uh, have debts. Um, And, you know, it's not a situation where you would say, well, uh, you know, the crisis is going to be over and there's going to be, you know, a better times are coming. In fact, it's the opposite. Um, Worse times are coming. There's less clients, very severe competitors, uh, and they will sell uh, less kilowatt hours. So, and, and that in an environment where, you know, we're post Fukushima, there is a very uh, significant backup, back um, fitting operations to be financed. Um, how is this all going to work? Uh, nobody knows really where the money is supposed to come from. And, you know, we're in the middle of an energy revolution, really. Um, you know, when you see that uh, in the U.S. now, you know, you have companies that guarantee uh, photovoltaics. Uh, installed uh, banking done for 10 to 20 percent below what the what the utilities offer. Jesus, we don't even have these companies yet in France. Uh, so in the future, it will be, unco- uh, you know, an even even a lot more difficult for a company like EDF su- to survive. And the same is true, f- uh, even more so for Arriva that is stuck in the nuclear business. You know, we have uh, uh, several examples here. Uh, here in Vermont, we had uh, Vermont Yankee, which was owned by uh, Entergy. And what we found is that as the stock prices declined, um, the money, the capital that was available to be poured back into the nuclear reactors also declined. And uh, they wound up skimping on, on safety concerns. And, of course, it sounds like the, the same uh, thing is possible. As the stock prices decline, that's the investors who cares. But... When the, when the people of France are put at risk because there's not enough capital to invest in safety, uh, that must become a pretty serious concern. It becomes a very serious concern. It becomes a very serious concern for the entire uh, utility industry in Europe. You have to picture that the 20 largest utilities in Europe lost half of their stock value, half their stock value since 2008. 
Now, half of their stock value means half a trillion euros, 500 billion euros. Those are dimensions of money that you can hardly even, you know, picture. So this industry is in, in, you know, in great crisis. And most of these utilities are actually nuclear utilities. So this is not only a, a national phenomenon. This is an issue for all of the European uh, uh, nuclear utilities, and it can have dramatic consequences for the, you know, guaranteeing the financing, not only of the current operating reactors, what, but what's going to happen to dis decommissioning cost, waste management, disposal, etc., etc., etc. I mean, there's a huge backlog of, of expenses that, that have to be um, managed in the future. Uh, before I sign off, is there anything else that you would like to share with us that I haven't covered? No, I think, well, maybe one thing. Uh, I think that it is remarkable to see that we have now large uh, banks and financing institutions that do their own uh, energy strategy assessments. And they come up with remarkable papers, uh, even over the past two months or so. Um, Citi, which is one of the huge uh, banks, published a paper called Energy 2020. We're not talking 2050 or 2100. Energy 2020. The revolution will not be televised. You know, I mean, that's a title of a bank. I mean, a huge bank because they say that, you know, the competitors on the renewable side, uh, for example, are a direct threat to the utility industry. Same assessment by companies like the largest Swiss bank, uh, UBS, that calculated that, you know, PVs plus uh, storage plus electric vehicle will be a system that has an, a payback uh, time by 2020 of six to eight years in a country like Germany. I mean, six to eight years, that means it's, it's affordable basically for everyone. If that is the case, what will the utilities sell tomorrow? And in that context, it is really extremely urgent that we have a very large debate on the future of these nuclear utilities and the management of the nuclear sector. Well, th thank you very much. You know, I, I refer to building nuclear power plants as, as building the Maginot Line all over again. And of course, you and France would appreciate that. You know, the, the Maginot Line was designed to fight the war before, not the war in the future. So I think we're tying ourselves into large behemoths, which is last century's war. You know, when I went to college, that was the, uh, that was the preferred, the only way we could do it. But times have changed. And in the 21st century, uh, it's time for a 21st century uh, look at the concept of baseload power and whether, in fact, we really need that. The concept has been flying out of the window already, and that is the most interesting. It's gone, and uh, it's just that, you know, If and I totally agree. If you today decide to build a nuclear power plant, it's like, you know, investing in a dinosaur and put it in a flower garden. It's just not the appropriate size. It's too slow. It's too big, and it's not at all within the kind of system that we're very clearly are in the course of developing. It's shifting from vertical integration to horizontal integration. And the future energy system will very much look like the internet. You know, it's, it's computing power today is not in one computer, huge size computer, it's millions of computer. And so today we have 1.4 million electricity generators in Germany. There's over 2 million electricity generators now in Australia. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's going fast. It's a revolution that is underway, and it's very fast. Well, the revolution will not be televised, but, but this interview will be. And I, I wanted to thank you very much, Michael Schneider, for spending the time with us from Paris today. Pleasure. Thanks for having me, Arnie. I'd like to take this moment to thank all of you who supported us here at Fairwinds Energy Education. It takes a good deal of effort and a solid crew to keep Fairwind sailing. Yearly, we ask for donations of any amount that you're able to give. Every donation is greatly appreciated and enables us to share worldwide 
the truth about nuclear power. I'm Arnie Gunderson. I'll keep you informed.